All right. Well, hello, everybody. We are in a little earlier this week for our topic video for the week, which, as I mentioned last week, is going to coincide with the Erie Canal, and that is the discussion of something of the Ohio canals right here in my home state. So at the same time that New York City is, well, not New York City, but the state of New York is building its own canal, at the same time that this is going on, there is the debate in other states whether or not canals are a worthwhile investment venture for development in their states. And the Ohio Canal System is really probably, I would say, the second major canal system to come about in the United States. There had been some small, like, individual ones for, like, mills and that in other states. But in terms of, like, massive state-long, like, cross-the-state canals, the Erie was really the first, and then Ohio is really the second state to really go all in on this idea of canals. And what is going to make Ohio a little different from New York is Ohio didn't just have one canal. It had two major main canals. I, I mean, New York had multiple branch ones, but it only had one main, and that was the Erie. Ohio is actually going to have two main ones and then a bunch of branches on top of that. It, it, the whole state pretty much was a spiderweb network of canals in many areas. So what we're going to look at today is kind of similar to how we looked at the Erie Canal. So we're going to mostly go over how did it come to be, a little bit of the construction, and then what is the ultimate economic impact, what, what impact does it have on the state that it is developed in, and then we'll also delve a little bit into you know what happened to them. Why don't we see cana these canals anymore? And in Ohio, they suffered a much more tragic fate than the Erie has. The Erie is still very much widely used. The ones in Ohio, in large part, have not been so fortunate. So we will discuss how that comes about and everything that goes along with it. And I sh shouldn't, hopefully, I hope to goodness I don't mess nothing up here because it would be an embarrassment to myself. I have studied these canals for going on four years now, and it's likely not going to end. So I very much consider myself a little bit of a self-made, um, I'll, I'll say buff on these on this topic, because uh, just because of all the material that I've had to go through, and I have drove all across this state trying to find every remnant I could possibly find of these canal locks and aqueducts and culverts and you name it. I have gone through most of the state looking for these things of what's still left. So today we're going to go ahead and cover this. And then to go along here, I do have some, for picture-wise, we're going to go show some historical ones that are in these books here that I have out of my own library, my own personal library, just to kind of illustrate some historical pictures that I couldn't necessarily always get with the Erie. So where does it all start? So the first thing, Ohio has to become a state, right? So that is going to happen on March 1st of 1803. Ohio is actually the 17th state added to the Union. It became a state in March 1st, 1803, and it was the first new state to be crafted out of what was the Old Northwest Territory, that one that had been established back in 1787 under the Articles of Confederation that would include most of, that would include all in some parts of other states. So in terms, it would have comprised Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and then a little sliver of Minnesota would have been included in that territory. And Ohio, when it becomes a state, it's a state, yes, because it's met the population threshold that it needed to, but Ohio is not really a state like New York. New York has obviously had obviously been a British colony for some time before it gained independence with the rest of the nation. And thus, it was a little bit more, I would say, settled, at least on the Atlantic coast. And where we mentioned with the Erie Canal, the western part of New York, like toward the Mohawk Valley, that was still pretty much a wilderness in some ways. It still wasn't all that much cleared and it still wasn't all that much settled. Take what western New York was at the time and imagine that that, was at Ohio, that would be about uh, what Ohio is in about 1803. Except unlike what was in New York, where it was just the western part of the state, the entire state of Ohio is covered in pure wilderness almost. There's some cities that are starting to spring up, but in large part, most of the state is still an untamed and uncleared wilderness that is not anything like what you'd see on the Atlantic coast. 
and this is going to present a problem of sorts when Ohio becomes a state. Now, when, when Ohio becomes a state, it is home to many farmers, in particular, who are trying to clear that land and establish their homes and their farms to establish some kind of a livelihood. How, and you have to keep in mind, Ohio, though Ohio's a state, it's still very much at this point in time, this is the nation's frontier. This is the edge of uh, civilization, so to speak. Now, Ohio, unfortunately, is not only is it heavily forested, but the entire northwestern corner of the state up toward, I don't know if anyone's ever familiar, but the whole area up near Toledo and Bowling Green and Bryan and Defiance, that whole northwestern corner up to, out to Fort Wayne, Indiana. At this time, that is a huge, massive, thick swampland what we in Ohio call the Great Black Swamp. And this is an almost impenetrable wetland for settlers to go through. Wagons cannot go through the swampland. It is full of bugs and disease. Even the Native Americans themselves that lived in Ohio, they would go hunting occasionally in the swamp. There were certain trails they could follow that the water wasn't too deep that they could go, you know, trek through it and go hunting. But not even the Native Americans would actually settle in this stuff. They would not settle in the swampland. It was too. It was just too nasty and too thick and just all sorts of things. It was inhospitable even to them to live in this. And this posed a. This was another major hindrance towards settlement of the state, especially that northwestern corner where you had that big swampland in the way. The state also had a massive need for transportation infrastructure. Ohio doesn't have that many roads not even dirt roads, because there is still a lot of forest that hasn't even been cleared yet to make a road, let alone does it have anything else. Ohio's two main connections to the outside world is Lake Erie, which at the time, before the Erie Canal wasn't really much of a connection at all, because of the factor that you, yeah, you go up to western New York and northern Pennsylvania, but at the time, that's just as much wilderness as Ohio is. So you're, for the longest time, Ohio's main artery to the outside world was down the Ohio River through and down through Kentucky as well with the Cumberland Gap. But you could go down the Ohio River and you could float down to New Orleans, New Orleans which up until 1803 was not even our territory. <laughs> it was Spanish territory until the Louisiana Purchase. Well, I take that back. It was French territory when we bought it, but up until roughly 1803, it had been Spanish territory. It had just recently been returned to the French under Napoleon. But Ohio is very much an isolated state, and although it have, has some access to eastern markets, mostly through the Mississippi and Ohio rivers, and a little bit for Lake Erie, what about the very internal cities within the state, or internal settlements within the state, in the very heartland? They have absolutely no connection, almost, to the outside world, and there's no easy way to get eastern products to them or what's even worse, they can't get their, they, these farmers in the interior can't really have any kind of easy way of getting their products to market without a long, long journey ahead of them. And by the time they might finally get them down to somewhere or down, say, on a flat boat to New Orleans, their product may go spoiled or there's more competitive pricing down there as well. The people that would be willing to take cheaper simply because they didn't have to go so far to deliver that crop and that product. So farmers that are coming from Ohio are probably going to ask for a little bit of higher rate and people aren't going to be so inclined to buy it. So Ohio settlers in Ohio and Ohio citizens are at a disadvantage. Let's, let's put it that, like that when Ohio becomes a state in 1803. Now, Ohio citizens, unfortunately for them, they had to endure this for roughly about a decade, at least. There it was a good solid decade up through the War of 1812 that they really just, they, there wasn't much they could do about it. It isn't until after the War of 1812 when the idea of a possible canal is really starting to be floated by the state legislature, and that is in part because of the Erie Canal. So George Washington, surprisingly, of all sources, our famous first president and founding father, he was actually among the first individuals to propose the idea of a canal connecting Lake Erie to the Ohio River and connecting these two great bodies of water. He was among the first. There have been others, but he was among the very first and most prominent early proponents of building such a canal and connecting these two bodies. 
Now, the imminent success of New York's Erie Canal by around, let's say, around 1821, when it becomes clear that the Erie Canal is going to be built and it's got a good chance it's going to succeed, this really starts to ratchet up the attention and the possibility to Ohio lawmakers of, what if we put a canal here in the state of Ohio, New York's building one, and it seems to be doing quite well, at least the construction is, we don't know how it's going to operate in the end, but it seems promising. What if we built one for our internal people in our state, the people that are in the heartland, so they have easier access and you know transport and trade and everything else? The same reason New York was looking to build its own. And the governor, Ethan Allen Brown, was really the major supporter by the early 1820s of Ohio getting its own canal as New York was undergoing at that time. Now, the state legislature eventually backed Brown's idea much more easier than Clinton had had in New York, where he kind of had to haggle with the New York legislature a little bit to get them to kind of to at least get a majority of them to support his idea for a canal. But the Ohio State Legislature was a lot quicker to grasp onto the governor's idea than New York had been to Clinton's. And on January 31st of 1822, a bill was passed that appropriated $6,000 from the state for the hiring of an engineer to survey the prospective routes for a possible canal in Ohio. And there would be a seven-man committee that would be appointed, which would include the governor himself, Governor Brown. The Ohio Canal Commission that was formed in January of 1822 actually was very fortunate because they managed to hire not just any engineer, but they hire, managed to hire esteemed engineer James Gee, 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 I'm probably going to botch this name, but I'm going to say Geeds. And James Geeds was a prominent engineer on the Erie Canal. He had designed many of the locks and culverts and routes on that on sections of the Erie Canal up in New York. And they were able to actually surprisingly pull him away from that project, despite the fact it was still being constructed, and kind of got him to say, hey, can you come out here and take a look at our state and you know, what do you, what routes do you possibly recommend for a canal in our state? Because you definitely have the expertise in this area to be able to tell us. And we'll pay, you, we'll pay you for it, but could you at least give us an estimate of where we could be looking to build one? And Geeds and his commissioners that are on the Ohio Commissioning, Ohio Canal Commission, the commissioners work with Geeds during this process. Most prominently, the two commissioners that work with him the most are Alfred Kelly and Makaja Williams, and they surveyed three possible routes in the spring of 1822 that are really catch Geed's eye as a possible locations for a canal. At the time, the state of Ohio is saying we're only going to have one canal, like New York is doing. They're not dead set to two yet. So at the time, we're looking for just a possible route. Where could we put one canal connecting Lake Erie to the Ohio River? The first idea, and we'll have a map here to kind of show you where these are here in just a second. So the first idea, a canal that would go down the western part of Ohio from roughly around where Toledo is now. Mind you, Toledo wasn't fully within Ohio's borders at the time this was done. That was still in dispute. But roughly, the idea of running one from route right where Toledo is at the mouth of Maumee River, down the Maumee River Valley, and then coming down across the divide into the Miami River Valley and going down western Ohio to Cincinnati. And that would be the end point on the Ohio River, would be Toledo to Cincinnati through the western part of the state. That was the first idea that was proposed by Geeds. The second idea that came about was a central route through the state, so down straight, straight down the middle. So I live in north central Ohio. I live not far from Lake Erie myself. I'm about, probably about an hour away from the lake. And the central route would have been from Sandusky, which is about an hour away from me. That would have been its starting. And then it would have come down the Sandusky River Valley, which is just in, I think, I'm trying to think, that's to the west of where I'm at right now. That would be to my west. And we're going to go down the Sandusky River Valley from Sandusky on Lake Erie, and then we'll go down, cut across to the divide into the Scioto River Valley, and we'll follow that down through the state capital of Columbus, and then we will go down and exit to the Ohio River at the town of Portsmouth on the Ohio River. The third and final route that was proposed, proposed by Geeds was an eastern canal from Cleveland, of all cities, on Lake Erie. I don't think you have to be from Ohio to know where Cleveland's at. You probably have a pretty good idea of that. Most people do. And it would come down from Cleveland, down the Portage and Cuyahoga River Valleys, and then cut across into the Muskegon, and eventually exit into the Ohio River around where Marietta is. 
where Marietta is. So that was your three proposed routes that Geeds came up with. And just to give you a little image here, I do have them in this book. It would just this is a very good illustration of what routes they were possibly looking to propose. I'm going to see how I'm going to hold this here. Get a good view of it. Okay, so this here is the western route that is proposed from Toledo. We're going to go down western Ohio until we exit right where Cincinnati is. That's your first route that's proposed. The central route would have been from Sandusky down well, roughly, not Sandusky, but Sandusky Bay in this image. I don't know why it's not at Sandusky. But we go down through here, through Central Ohio. We go down through Columbus, which is in Franklin County here. It's the state capital. And then we'd come down, down the Soto River Valley to the Ohio River at Portsmouth. The third route that was proposed was this one. Although this one is not entirely correct, because this is kind of also showing the modern canal system. And we had one going from Cleveland, and it would have went straight after this, not cut across. And this one would have went to Marietta pretty straight down, is what the three proposed routes were. And then over on our other page here, here we have an illustration of Erie Canal engineer James Geeds. This was the guy that came to Ohio from working on the Erie Canal to kind of give this survey of where he thought some possible routes were for a canal. And then here is the two commissioners that were really influential in helping him. And this is Alfred Kelly. And at the bottom is Makaija Williams. And they would continue to work on the project during its entire length because Geeds would actually leave Ohio. He would not stay very long because he actually thought Ohio was just a plain old wilderness. And after he proposed these three routes, he pretty much said, yeah, I'm done. I don't want nothing more to do with this anymore because Ohio is just too difficult for me. <laughs> So he said, I'll, I'll leave you the three routes I've plotted, but I'm going back up to New York to finish the canal I've been working on for so many years, because that's a lot easier than trying to work through a wilderness at this point. So Gies actually backs out, and once he backs out of the planning period, it really falls to Williams and Kelly to take over the project in the commission's work since he is now gone. Geeds, well not Geeds, but Kelly and Williams end up concluding that there is not enough water in the Sandusky River Valley to really support a central canal all the way through. So they out they outrule that, okay, a central canal route is not going to happen because there's not enough water to maintain a, a significant water level in there. A sufficient. So that was to the detriment of the state capital of Columbus, because Columbus is the state capital, and this kind of irritates some of the local politicians from that city because they're saying, well, we're the state capital. We should have access to a state canal. It only makes sense. I mean, look at New York. Albany has access to their canal, and that is a little bit to the detriment of Columbus citizens. They eventually, there is political fighting that goes on in the Ohio legislature that ultimately will help determine what is going to happen with this proposed canal system. And what happens is the route, there's three routes, but there's multiple cities in the state that are really showing some promise as growing cities that all want access to the canal. And if you follow just one canal, there's no way you can hit them all, at least not feasibly and not even architecturally, because one of the ideas eventually was proposed since, like, you had Cleveland up here on Lake Erie, and then you had Columbus down in the middle, you had Cincinnati down here, what about a diagonal canal? And the, looking at that idea, there was no way they could have done it. It was too much. The cost would have been too high. The amount of construction and planning to even get that done might not have even been possible because of some of the ridges and water divides they would have had to go through. And they ultimately decided, no, there is no way we can do that either. So the political fighting between the major cities, which at this time is mostly Columbus and Cleveland and Cincinnati, are your major big three, I would say, at the time. Maybe Zanesville and Marietta to a point. This is what is ultimately going to influence the creation of what we in Ohio called the Compromise of the Canals or what was officially known as the Canal Act of 1825. And the Canal Act of 1825 was the act that officially established Ohio is going to get a canals, it's going to get a canal system, but we're actually going to have two because we're going to try to compromise here. 
So the eastern, there will be an eastern canal. That will be the main canal the state is going to concern with. It's going to go straight away from Lake Erie down to the Ohio River. However, the eastern canal is not going to go from Cleveland to Marietta. It's not going to go straight down. What is going to happen is this eastern canal will start at Cleveland. We're going to call it the Ohio and Erie Canal. And it is going to run down from the Portage and Cuyahoga Rivers. And it's going to run down roughly to where the headwaters of the Muskegon River are, where it officially formed, which is at a town and city called Coshocton nowadays. And as, once it gets to Coshocton, it is then going to, instead of going straight south to Marietta, along, along down the Muskegon River, it is going to head west along the Rick Licking River Valley. Yes, it's going to head west now. So we're going to go straight down. I'm going to pretend this way is west to you. And this way is east. So we're going to come down from Cleveland, whatever squiggly line you want to do for river. But then instead of going south, we're going to do this. We're going to go west to Columbus. So here's Columbus. Here's Coshocton. Up here is Cleveland. So here is Coshocton. Well, not Coshocton, but Columbus. I'm sorry. So down to Cleveland to Coshocton, west to Columbus. And now we're going to turn south and go down the Scioto River down to Portsmouth which was half of that old central route that had been proposed. So we're going to go, a mm, mm, mm. little bit twisty turny. <laughs> so that was the main idea for the Ohio and Erie. That would satisfy the desire of Cleveland. It would satisfy the desire for the state capital to be connected to a canal. But what about Cincinnati and Dayton? Dayton is also a prominent city in western Ohio. They would be sidetracked entirely by this plan. Well, as part of the compromise that came about from this Canal Act, they decided we're going to build a second canal. However, this one, at first at least, is not going to go all the way to Lake Erie. It's going to start in Cincinnati on the Ohio River, and it will end up in Dayton. And we're going to call this one the Miami Canal, or after the Miami River, which we'll use as a water source. There was a provision in this act that did guarantee that one day, although the Miami Canal for the time being is only going to go to from Cincinnati to Dayton, one day it will be extended to Lake Erie. So one day, the day will come that Ohio will have two canals that both go from Lake Erie to the Ohio River. But the Miami, the Miami Canal would eventually happen a little later, whereas the Ohio and Erie from the very beginning, they knew this was going to go from one body of water to another. So Alfred Kelly would end up supervising the construction of the Ohio and Erie Canal, while Makaija Williams would be the one that would be put to oversee the construction of the Miami Canal. These canals were state-funded, as in the case of New York's canal, uh, as in the case of the Erie, because, of course, the federal this is about the same time, the same federal government that had denied Clinton funding for the Erie Canal, so they weren't really all that willing to grant funding for Ohio's canals. The only thing that I have found that they did, that the federal government was willing to kind of help with was Congress was willing to tr sell land and help the state get some land available to put aside for the canal. But other than that, they weren't willing to grant like any loans or federal funding to, you know, pay off some of the financial costs of building these canals. The state had to do it. And the problem with Ohio was, unlike New York, which very much, I think, had the economic resources to pay for a canal, and it definitely did. I mean, the Erie Canal paid for itself within two years. Ohio really, for two canals in the economic state that it was in at the time, it didn't really have the economic backing in reserves to really fund these canals entirely. They had to rely heavily on state loans and bonds and stock sales. And in large part, the state of Ohio actually almost went bankrupt by building these two canals. They used almost all the money they had for funding into these things. That brings us to construction of the canals and when that comes about. So on July 4th of 1825, so this the same year that the Erie Canal is finished is the same year that Ohio starts building its canals. So on July 4th, again, the... Erie Canal was started on July 4th of 1817, but this is going to be July 4th, 1825, at the Licking Summit, which was the highest point of, on the Licking River Valley that the Ohio and Erie would have to transgress and go up from the Ohio River. Ohio, the Ohio and Erie actually had two summits. The other one was the Portage, which is where Akron is. Akron is actually on that summit, whereas the Miami Canal only had one. 
But on the at the Licking Summit on July 4th of 1825, near Newark, if you know where Newark is, around the Columbus area, I think, in Licking County. At the, Lick, at the Licking Summit on July 4th of 1825, near Newark, the ground was officially broken for the Ohio and Erie Canal. But the special thing was, it wasn't just broken by a bunch of random workers. The first spades of earth to be turned over for this construction of this canal was done by gov- the current go- gov- Ohio governor, Jeremiah Morrow, at that point, and then as a guest, Governor DeWitt Clinton of New York, who had been instrumental in the construction of the Erie, and we discussed in the last video. So Clinton got to turn the spade, first spades of earth for Ohio's can- both of Ohio- Ohio's main canals, along with Ohio's governor. So that is actually quite interesting that he came all this way just to help out with that, and that's a connection that the two share, among others that we're going to see. The standard canal... C- I, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So on July 4th, they start construction of the Ohio and Erie. They do the first spades of earth overturned at near Newark for the Ohio and Erie. And then on July 21st, just two weeks later in 1825, at the town of Middletown in Ohio, which is in western Ohio, toward, I think, the Dayton, between Dayton and Cincinnati. It's south of Dayton. But on July 21st, the... Governor Morrow and Governor Clinton both head to Middletown two weeks after breaking ground for the Ohioan area, and they end up breaking ground for the Miami Canal there. And there's a marker at both sites that you can go see that you can actually, you know, go and actually take a look at. And, and coincidentally here, I'm trying to think if I'm missing something. No, no, I'm not missing something. My bad. <laughs> So, ground has now officially been broken in July of 1825 for both of these main canals. Now, here's another connection that we're going to share with the Erie Canal up in New York. The standard canal dimensions were pretty much this copied over from the Erie Canal. They didn't really change them that much. They kept them pretty much the same because they knew it had worked, and they could tweak them later on if they needed to, but they felt that it would be more than sufficient for the needs that the state was looking for. So, the same minimum depth of four foot would be used on Ohio's canals. Sometimes they were a little deeper, just because, again, these are all hand-dug. They weren't using power tools. These were shoveled out by hand with wheelbarrows and carts and shovels and picks. This was a very manual, labor-intensive job. So they were four, at least four foot deep. Sometimes it could be five or six, but typically four. Their width at the bottom, so at the bot, the bed of the canal, what's going to be underwater, has to be at least 26 feet wide. And at the top, where it's going to kind of spread out, so that way it kind of narrows as you get to the bottom, like a river, at the top of the canal, it had to be 40 feet wide at the water level. The banks were, and this was something I'm not sure they did with the Erie, but I'm sure they might have. I just couldn't find any mention of them doing it. But the banks of the Ohio canals were specifically lined with clay, and this was to try to keep the banks watertight. They did not want the possibility, because this is still soil, water could soak through and get lost, and the canal would never hold and retain water. So they put lined the banks with clay to make sure that they would retain that water. Then they could maintain the water level and make them waterproof. Now, most of the locks in Ohio were built of stone or sand. Particularly, there was two different types of stones that they used, depending on which canal it was. And I didn't know this until relatively recently. It, it really, I noticed it when I went and seen the locks, but I guess it never really full, fully registered in my mind that there was one canal over another that I was seeing this type of stone and I wasn't seeing it on another. So on the cases of the locks on the Ohio and Erie Canal, we're having the locks made out of sandstone, while those on the Miami and Erie are made primarily out of limestone. So there is a difference between the two. And unlike the, I don't know if the Erie Canal had any, but at least on the Miami and Erie, there is a certain section of it that down near uh, what is now uh, Grand Lake St. Mary's was a big old reservoir, but now it's Grand Lake St. Mary's. It's a there's a state park there and everything near the town of St. Mary's and Salina. Around that area, that was heavily timbered. I would say all the way up through Defiance. And the locks in this area, not all of them were made out of limestone. Many of them were actually made out of wood. 
to save costs. Wood was cheaper to buy, and there was an abundance of it in the area. Unfortunately, that has meant in large part that these wooden locks have not survived to this day. I mean, wood rots fairly easily, and it also later came to kind of backfire on the state a little bit by cutting corners with this from, during construction because of the factor these wooden locks required a lot more maintenance to maintain and keep them operational. So later on, many wooden locks were replaced with stone, or you get to the early 1900s, they, some of them were replaced with concrete, but many of them that were wooden were just high maintenance, and, avenge, and there's just nothing left of them pretty much nowadays. But all, that was only in heavily timbered areas. Now, most uh, contractors that were hired out by the state to complete sections of the canal were hired by were hired German and Irish immigrants, to work on the canal. So these contractors would hire primarily immigrants, but the special thing is that these German and Irish immigrants that are working on Ohio's canals had actually, been, many of them had just worked on the Erie Canal up in New York and had simply migrated to Ohio because they heard, oh, Ohio's building some canals now. Well, New York's done, don't need us to build this one anymore. Why don't we go to Ohio? There's still work to be found, boys. So they go to Ohio and they start, continue to work on Ohio's canals after just finishing one up in New York. Their daily rate of pay was around 30 cents a day and what they called a jigger of whiskey because there was the belief that for some odd reason that whiskey could keep malaria away and malaria, many canal workers did die building the canals. They estimated there was about four or six deaths per mile of canal built simply due to fact, factors like disease. Not so much injuries that I'm aware of, but mostly disease. There were all kinds of bugs and stuff like that that just brought malaria and yellow fever and nasty diseases that could kill a man back in those days. In fact, one of my uh, ancestors, I have learned through ancestry, he actually was an engineer on the Ohio and Erie Canal during its construction, and he had worked on the section down around uh, Coshocton and uh, going down to Dresden. And he ended up dying of malaria back in the day while he worked on the canal. So I actually have a relative that not only was an engineer on these canals and part of the process of building them, but he also unfortunately was one of those figures that he ended up becoming a victim of their construction due to disease. And the canals during their construction were also going to see the start of settlements that would later grow into major cities, a pro perhaps the most prominent being that of Akron. Akron literally grew up around a hut of little settlement that grew around the Portage Summit, where workers had to build with, I think they had to build like 15 locks within one mile. It was a massive rise in a short distance. And then Akron later becomes a major ship shipyard shipbuilding yard for canal boats. It becomes a center of commerce during the canal era. And even after the canal is gone, Akron has grown on to become a major Ohio city nowadays. They were also, and I don't know if they did this with New York, but in Ohio, for the summit levels at least, they had to worry about maintaining the canal's water level on those levels. So they wondered, how can we do that without, because there's no major river between these divides, but we have to make sure the canal's still getting water. The answer, get a reservoir dug. And this is actually something probably a little bit more stunning. The reservoirs that would be built were some of the largest that had been made at the time. In fact, one of them in particular was the largest man-made lake in the world at the time it was bit, at the time it was dug. And mind you, it was dug by hand. And I'm going to see if I can bring that up here in just a second. So the reservoirs that were dug, there were mostly just one for the Ohio and Erie, and that was Buckeye Lake or Buc Buckeye Reservoir. And there were three dug for the summit on the, Mi on the Miami Canal, which was Indian Lake, which kind of already existed, and they simply enlarged it and connected it. Laramie Reservoir, which I think was in a very similar situation, that they simply enlarged what was there, and then the Grand Reservoir, what is now called Grand Lake St. Mary's out in western Ohio, that was a result of damming in a creek so that it would retain water, and then they dug this massive lake that, at the time of completion in 1845, was the site of the world's largest man-made lake for many years, and I 
also have learned that in 1891, it was the site of the world's first offshore oil drilling rig. The first offshore dr oil drilling operation happened in that little canal reservoir. And today it's a state park, just like uh, Lake Laramie, Indian Lake, and Buckeye Lake. They're all state parks now. They're all pretty much preserved. And just to give you maybe a sense of the size here, of the scale, I don't know how well it's going to come in here. I really don't know how well. <laughs> I'm going to use a default view, I think. Just because that might be easier. So this lake, I don't know how well it's going to come up. This is Grand Lake St. Mary's out in West Central Ohio. This was the Grand Reservoir, the canal ran along over here, which is what all these blue dots are for that town. And there was a small feeder canal that connected it. But just to give you a sense of scale, the little scale I had on here, down here, this is about two miles long. And this whole lake's longer than that. It spans into two counties. And it is visible from a wider view. It's a big enough reservoir that if you look at a general map, here of Ohio, and then you come down into here, I mean, you can very well see it. And then that was just, nowadays, I think it has a blue-green algae problem. I hope to actually move out to that area one day just because I like it, but that was an astonishing thing of engineering on their part to have dug this thing entirely by hand to a depth of about eight feet. So between 1825 and 1847, when canal construction, by the state at least, was largely completed, the state built a grand total of about 813 miles of canals, including branch canals and feeders. The Ohio Canal, the Ohio and Erie Canal was about 309 miles long, and then the Miami and Erie was roughly around 274. And this on the back of here shows a good map of what those canal and their feeders would look like. So here we have the Ohio and Erie going down from Cleveland down to uh, Coshocton, which is that where Roscoe is, because that was a village across the, uh, across the river at the time, and it still is today. And then we start cutting west along the Licking River down to Columbus here. There's a small feeder that connects it to Columbus, and then it goes down to Portsmouth. And then these were some feeders. This was a canalized river, not so much a canal, but this was a canal. The Hocking, that was a private indenture. Uh, the Pennsylvania and Ohio was a private. The Sandy and Beaver was private. And then you have over here the Miami up to, I believe, is this Dayton? Oh, Dayton's here. My bad. <laughs> then we go up through Piqua, straight up, and then we turn along the Maumee River Valley and go to Toledo. And this was one actually that went across Indiana. We'll discuss here in just a second. We'll talk about what that is. So that brings us to, at the end of canal construction, there is a total of, the state constructed a total of 29 dams, 294 locks, and 44 aqueducts. And the net cost of this, just for the state, in 1825 dollar amounts would have been about $13 million. In 2024, that same $13 million would approximately equal about $404,992,000. So we went from spending $13 million back in 1825 to if the state underwent a similar endeavor today, that would be costing them about $404 million, almost $405 million. So on July 4th of 1827, the first boat, the Ohio, called the Ohio, traveled the segment of the Ohio and Erie Canal between Cleveland and Akron. That was that segment was officially open within two years, and that was the first boat to travel on any of the Ohio Canal. So that technically marks the first time a boat went on the Ohio Canal system. And then we have in the eighteen by eighteen thirty two, I believe, is when that one was completed. Yes. The Ohio and Erie Canal was the final segment from Chillicothe down to Portsmouth was finally completed and opened, and the whole canal by then was, in turn, with that opening, was the whole canal completed. 
on October 15th of 1832. So the Ohio and Erie, it took them from 1832, well, 1825 to 1832. So it took them seven years to build. Whereas the Miami, or what will become the Miami and Erie, and we're going to tell you why in just a second, was started in 1825, and it took them until June of 1845. So a little bit longer to complete that one, simply because, like we mentioned, the Ohio Canal Act had authorized that the Miami Canal initially was just going to be Cincinnati to Dayton, and eventually it would be extended. Well, it was eventually extended, but it was done in like two different extensions that took several years to get A, the funding, and B, to actually get the construction done and then set up another fund to get the other section completed. And in the 1840s, the Miami Canal was officially renamed the Miami and Erie Canal after it shared a joined route to Toledo to Junction, which is just south of Defiance, with Indiana's Wabash and Erie. And I'll show you again what I mean by that. So Indiana was building the Wabash and Erie, which was its venture into canal building, and that was actually the nation's longest canal that was ever made, and I believe the longest canal in the Western Hemisphere ever built. And it wanted access for their canal to Lake Erie, so they came across with a plan, well, why don't we let you, because they want to go to Toledo too. Well, we the state officially agrees with Indiana, we'll finance the construction of the portion of your canal that goes into Ohio territory if you if you meet us up to the border. And then we'll have our, our canal, the Miami, join yours at Junction, which would be this little join point right here, and then they'll share the same route up to Toledo. And... In 1849, the state legislature officially said, we're going to rename this the Miami and Erie, because it is joined with the Wabash and Erie. So there was a name change for that one. So that brings us to canal construction being completed. And let me see here if I have any images of construction-wise. I know those books don't have anything. Uh, here's a good image of what we're looking at for... Uh, the specifics of the depth gauges, I guess, a good diagram of what we're looking at. So here you have the rivers down here. They were usually built next to a river for a water source. You have the banks lined with clay, 40 feet wide up here on the top on the water level, so that two boats could go in like two different lanes. 28 feet down here at the bottom and about four foot deep. These are some of your tools that would have had to dig it. And... Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this cover off just because it's getting in my way. <laughs> I worry about putting it back on when we're done with this. But I just don't want to ruin that cover. <laughs> and then we have, let me see here if we have anything. Show you some of the pictures that we have here. Uh, here is like an aqueduct. This was the one near uh, Shockton. This is beneath the canal carrying it over what was the whole wall Honding River and still is. This is the top of it where the canal is. This was a wooden aqueduct, some were made out of stone. And these had to be drained at times. I mean, they weren't always operational. Like, here is a stone aqueduct that still exists to this day. I can say that with definity because I've actually been to it. And they've redone it a little bit. This is the six-mile uh, aqueduct near uh, St. Mary's, Ohio, near Grand Lake St. Mary's. So the canal is up here, and it actually lets the canal drain some excess water when it needs to near the creek below. A little smaller, but there. I'm seeing here is a boat yard at Akron back in the day, building some canal boats, what they look like. I'm trying to see if I can find a very good picture of a lock here, which I could probably just go to my other book here to find. But we'll get into the economics, I suppose. So the economics and the golden age of the Ohio Canal system. So Ohio's canals were a massive success upon their completion as they opened up Ohio's interior to trade and travel. They had, strangely enough, most people don't realize this, there actually was a speed limit on these things. You could only go four miles an hour 
on these canals. Your horse could not gallop and run down the canal and create a big old wash wake because the fear, the problem was they feared if you went faster than four miles an hour, the wake from the waves that the boat would generate could actually wash out the banks over time and could actually cause significant damage to the berm banks. So that was why they enforced a four mile per hour speed limit that you couldn't go faster than that because we don't want the banks washing out. And back in 1850, prices could vary depending on year. The state did collect tolls on these things for revenue. But back in 1850, one of the prices that I could find was roughly about the cost of about three or four cents. It was what it would cost, at least on the Miami and Erie in about 1850, about three or four cents a mile to go down, at least a mile down the canal. They could re A boat could now reach Lake Erie from the Ohio River within approximately a week. It could take a little less, but it would be about a week's journey, probably if you went all the way down. Of course, not many people went all the way down to one end of the other. Sometimes they just stopped at a town that was down the canal or up it. They didn't need to go all the way. And the peak year for both canals was the year 1851. The Ohio and Erie that year made approximately from revenue was about $447,128 for the state, which in today's money would be about 17 million yeah, seventeen million nine hundred and nine thousand three hundred and thirty-four dollars. While the Miami and Erie in that same year made a little slightly less, but still a very high amount of three hundred and fifty-one thousand eight hundred and ninety-seven dollars in revenue from tolls and taxes collected, which would amount to about fourteen million ninety-four thousand nine hundred and thirty-seven dollars today in twenty twenty-four. So, was the money amounts that we have here? So, there's a visual of the money amounts. If you want to see. And then Ohio, as a consequence of the canals being built, actually became a growing state due to them. It opened up the interior of the state to commerce, both from the Atlantic seaboard into foreign commerce a little bit as well. It also opened it up more to travel. People could more freely get around in the state and get their goods to market and get uh, export uh, imported goods into the state that were not so much available locally. So the state is going to become a leading agricultural producer because of this. Mostly, you have a lot of farmers in the state. They now have easy access to get their goods to market, and they can now easily ship out their farm goods on the canals. And it would become actually the United States' third most popular state by the 1850s. Ohio, of course, is not that now, but at the time, that was a massive massive boost because of the canals. In fact, between 1826 and 1859, real estate values in the 37 Ohio counties that held canals within them actually rose over 140%, just the value of living there, the value of property to buy. It boosted the property values because everyone wanted to live close to the canal, so the property values went up significantly. Private canal ventures were also made by companies and towns due to the success of the main ones, Two of the most prominent, as I mentioned, was the one of them was the Hocking Canal, which was made by a private company and eventually connected to the Ohio and Erie Canal, went down to Hocking, Ohio, and it was mostly for shipping coal out of the lower southeastern Ohio hills. It was mostly coal that was shipped around that canal. And then very close to my home here near Sandusky, there was a short two-mile canal built at the little village of Milan where Thomas Edison was actually born, and that was a little different because it was about 13 foot deep and lake schooners could actually come up directly from the up the Huron River and then come up this little canal from two locks and come to Milan. And at one point, Milan was the world's second largest wheat producing port. Only the Russian port of Odessa shipped more wheat a year than Milan did. And that was a little private venture as well. That one, I think, closed about 1868 due to some flooding that had destroyed a large portion of it. The, unfortunately, the canals were only a seasonal operation. There was about five months of the year they couldn't operate. They typically would close the canals down around the first freeze, so that would usually be early November, sometimes late October if it was a little early winter. And they wouldn't typically open until the full spring thaw came. So at your best, you're looking at late March, but you're probably looking more at April. So from April to October is your prime operating season on the canals. Mind you, during the winter, the canal portions in southern Ohio could sometimes stay open because they didn't always get as much snow or cold. And sometimes those southern portions would remain open. But as for the northern portions, like near Toledo and Defiance and Cleveland, 
in Akron, th those shut down during the winter. There was no way those could operate at all. The canal also, the canals also provided water for hundreds of paper and flour mills, which developed alongside them. They also helped to develop cities. As we mentioned, Akron was one. Cincinnati also continued to grow because of it. In fact, if anyone's ever been to Cincinnati, you've probably heard of the Over the Rhine uh, district of the city, and that region got its name not only because of the large uh, population of German immigrants that moved into that section of the city, but it was called Over the Rhine because back in the day, that city was kind of separated from the rest of it. That section of Cincinnati was separated from the rest of the city by the Miami and Erie Canal that kind of ran right straight through and cut them off. So that was referred to as Over the Rhine. So what was the decline that the Ohio canals eventually faced? It's, it's kind of sad. After hitting an operational peak, and I'd say about the early 1850s, as we mentioned, their peak year was 1851, the canal's revenue began to actually decline very significantly. In fact, by 1861, so by the time of the start of the Civil War, revenue for the state was down to only 109286 That is a significant drop from where we used to be pulling 300 or 400 three or four hundred thousand a year on each canal and now this was total this was for both canals in 1861 they only amounted entirely to a little over a hundred thousand dollars just within 10 years and this was caught in this drastic reduction in the revenue from the canals caused the state to lease the system to private operators for a period of time and the canals had high maintenance costs. Of course, these wooden aqueducts and some of these locks were not exactly the best when it came to maintenance. During the winter, when ice would form, they would constantly uh, break some of the wood. They would leak profusely when the spring thaw came. Some of them would get washed out and had to be entirely repaired before the canal boats could go down. And it was a costly maintenance work on these things. And the railroads were also gaining pop popularity at this time. And that was all, probably the biggest contributor was that railroads were really coming into Ohio by the 1850s, 1860s. And it's just they're faster. They operate year round and they were somewhat cheaper and people just started turning to them instead of the canal system. And thus the private operators who were in charge of leasing the canals, they kind of also cut corners when it came to maintenance costs to kind of maintain their own profit. And the state actually would retake control in 1878. In fact, one of the uh, most horrible examples I can think of that I know of personally that they have done that the private leasers did back in the day. I don't even, no, it wasn't private leasers, but it was a private contractor who was hired by the state to repair a lock. They were to redo it in concrete, but they filled the forms with all manner of just trash and garbage and anything they could find to stuff it and get the job done quicker and cheaper. The state still paid them, and the state didn't find out that this had been done until 2004 when they went to try to reconstruct the lock. And as they're trying to redo it in concrete, they start finding all this garbage and like, oh, so this lock wasn't done right 100 years ago. <laughs> they unfortunately were unable to fully restore that lock, and they had to end up going for a complete uh, reconstruction of it in order to get something there. So by 1878, the state took back control of a Ohio Canal system that was not only losing money, but at that point, since it, the maintenance hadn't always been the best, they were also in bad need of some repair. And over the next three decades, Ohio sold many of the water rights on the canals to try to raise money and make money off of them. And by 1905, they had made enough money that the state decided we're going to go ahead and try to do a little bit of a refit. Uh, renovation of the canal system to try to maybe make it profitable again. And they began refurbishing a lot of the still operated sections because by 1905, some cities had actually filled in and shut down portions of the canal as they were no longer being used. And thus the water was stagnant and it was just, it was collecting sewage and disease and everything. In fact, in Cincinnati, there was a law passed that you could not swim in the canal and there were boys that would go swim in it anyway because it was just nasty. It was filled with pollution and trash and garbage. People dumped their sewers in there and kids would go swim in this. In fact, there was a little club formed years later that for anyone could be a member that could prove that they swam in the canal as a youth. And among our members of that club was none other than, none other than President William Howard Taft, our 27th president and our big man president he was the biggest president ever in office because when he was a kid he had grown up in cincinnati and he had actually swam in it 
So during the 1905 refit, some of the locks were redone in concrete, which saved some of the ones that were wood that ordinarily would have rotted away, but they were now redone in concrete. And there was also bank strengthening, putting more clay on there, making sure they could sustain that. Unfortunately, the refit really didn't do much. When it was completed in about 1909, the state really did not get the return and revenue that it was hoping would come from it. And the death knell for the Ohio Canal system in what most people will, the, the canal era typically dates to this day. So it starts in 1825 and typically ends in 1913. Because in 1913 in March, that is when you have the great flood of 1913 sweep through the state. Almost every river valley overflows its banks. The canals, of course, because they were water bodies, did the same. And the flood manages to wash out hundreds of banks on the canals. It destroys locks, destroys aqueducts, destroys all kinds of things. And Akron, to release some floodwaters that were backing up because one of the lock gates was holding them back, they actually took dynamite to the lock to blow it up. And that was lock one in Akron just to release that held back flood water. And by the time that the flood was done, the state did look into possibly repairing the canals. But when they looked at the damage, they, uh, they, ultimately, they ultimately determined, no, the cost of repair is not worth what we're getting from revenue on these things. And after 1913, the state unofficially, it wasn't until 1929 that they officially closed them. But unofficially, after 1913, the canals were just left to rot. They were abandoned. They weren't maintained. And later on, they, many of the sections were filled in. People tried to build a subway in the bed of the Miami and Erie Canal through Cincinnati for many years. It never got completed. But 1913 was really the death knell. The canals were already dying. But 1913, I would say, is the definitive year where it, the de if you wanted to put a death date on the canal system, that was when it came. And that is pretty much what happened to the Ohio Canal System. Now, I'll see here, I do have some pictures of the flood, I think, in this book in particular, in the Miami and Erie. There is some pictures of the aftermath of the flood of 1913, just to kind of give you a look at what that looked look like. I mean, it was bad. This is Dayton, I believe. Yeah, this is Dayton and Middletown below during that flood. And then we have, uh, like right here is a section of canal after it where the canal boat has actually just been washed up on the bank and left there after that point. Here's a look from, uh, from the canal near uh, town of Ottoville up in northwest Ohio. It's completely washed out there. And then down here as well in Napoleon is just it was statewide. It was a crippling blow to the canal system after they were trying to restore it, and it just never worked. Here we have them actually trying to put the subway into the old bed of it in Cincinnati. It never got completed. They're still under halfway constructed subway tunnels under Cincinnati to this day. <laughs> Trying to see if I can find any other ones here. Now, here's an example, though, I'd like to point out. If I can... I don't have a secondary picture, but this is a picture in St. Mary's, uh, the bottom one here. Lock 13 was originally made out of wood. This is a 1900 picture of it. And today, this lock has been completely restored. I think it's actually the cover. This is the lock that is the cover image for this video. This this is that that is that lock today. It has been redone in concrete. They uh, It was buried under the foundation of a building until 2006, but they've managed to turn it into a park. But back in the day, it was wood. It was one of the locks that got redone in 1905 in concrete, which ended up kind of saving it. And then I'll see here. If there's anything else in this one, at least. Uh, I think here, here we're going through the... Over the Rhine District, or here's the canal through Cincinnati back in the day. And let me see here if there's any on the Ohio and Erie here. Uh, here's a picture of Akron during and after the flood. This is near Lock 9 in Akron. This is during the flood. This is the canal. And here's afterward where the gates just washed out and everything else in Akron.
at a mill here that was on top of it by the canal or by a slack water dam that was by it. And here's kind of an ominous, I think, picture to me is this one right here of this is in Roscoe near Roscoe and Roscoe Village in Coshocton, which you can go to today. It's in a uh, restored canal village here in Ohio. And the canal went into this basin here because there's a lock over here and this was a turning basin. And then going over it, this right here is a train, <laughs> which would end up kind of being the death knell of the canal. I mean, there's all kinds of photos out there, and I just wanted to show a couple of them that I know of that were kind of significant to me. Well, this one I just kind of like. Down in the country in southern Ohio, we have a boat coming down and just being pulled through the countryside on the canal. That one, I think, completes our video pretty much for today. Now, I do have a clip or two I'm going to try to put posts in their own videos here that I took while I was doing my four, three past years of research and just going over the state because over the past three years, I tried to photographic, photographically document every remaining site that I could pinpoint, and I ended up coming out with both of these massive photo albums <laughs> that I've created on my own, <laughs> just documenting all the sites that I could find, for example, or we had, uh, let me find a good picture of a lock here if I can, like here's a lock in uh, Delphos, Ohio, that is still there, trying to identify them if I could, but I've just gone through three years of this stuff, and along the way with the photos, I've managed to take some videos of some canal boat experience that you can go on. In fact, there's one lock on the entire canal system that is still in operation, and that is up in uh, Providence Metro Park near Toledo. That There is a boat ride you can go on, and they take you through up and down the lock twice. You go up once, and then you'll come back, and you'll go down, and it's the only lock in the state that still works, and I will post a clip of that on here as a video of what that looked like when the water was filling and you're on the boat just to kind of give you a glimpse of what it might have looked like back in the day and this one honestly was probably even the bigger one the ohio and erie it just took longer so that concludes today's video i'll try to post those clips here very soon as soon as i can possibly and maybe in the future i will try to post some of the pictures or whatever that i have of the things but we'll see so that concludes for today. So if anyone has any questions or any comments or any suggestions or whatever, be sure to leave that in the comment section below. I know today was a little bit longer video, but this was a little bit of a more, it's a native topic and I like to spend the time on the native topics and it's also something I've been highly interested in. So just wanted to go ahead and get that out of the way. So for next week, I don't know what we're covering yet. We'll get to it, I guess, when we get to it. I know for since March is coming, we are going to do one on St. Patrick's Day and the history of that holiday, which I don't feel a lot of people really know over what St. Patrick's Day is about. So we'll make sure that we get that within the next coming month. So until next week, hopefully everyone continues to stay well, continues to not have any kind of problems arise. I mean, we're coming into spring here, so hopefully everything's going good. And we'll see you all back here next week for our next video of whatever that might be.